Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Ryan Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie The Lady Eve from 1941. The studio was Paramount Pictures. The release date was February 25th, 1941. The running time, 94 minutes, and it was in black and white. Leonard Maltin from his classic movie guy gives it three and a half out of four stars. His quick little synopsis is Barbara Stanwyck is a con artist who sets her eyes on the wealthy Henry Fonda, who is the dolts to end all dolts, who proclaims that snakes are my life. Sometimes silly and strident, this film grows funnier with each viewing, thanks to Preston Sturges' script and breathless pace and two uncomparable stars. Rotten Tomatoes even gives it 100% fresh from 47 reviews. Their critics' consensus is a career highlight for Preston Sturges. The Lady Eve benefits from Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda's sparkling chemistry and a script that inspired countless Battle of the Sexes comedies. So after taking a film appreciation class after my first year of college, I scoured the video stores and, of course, cable television for classic films. One of the actors that really piqued my interest was Barbara Stanwyck, especially after seeing Double Indemnity in that particular class. The Lady Eve was an easy sell for me when I read the quick plot in the TV listings many, many years ago. Okay, let's get into the main cast, of course, Barbara Stanwyck, and she plays Jean Harrington. Pretty much covered Stanwyck's career up to this point in the Ball of Fire episode, which came out a few months back. And this film was released a few months prior to Ball of Fire. 1941 was a great year for Stanwyck, as she was also in Meet John Doe with Gary Cooper. If Stanwyck's in a film, I'm most likely going to watch it. Henry Fonda plays Charles Pike. Surprisingly, I haven't covered a Henry Fonda movie yet. Obviously, you hear the name Fonda, and the acting lineage is similar to the name Barrymore. Henry was obviously a superstar before his children continued the legacy, that being Jane Fonda and Peter Fonda. Prior to The Lady Eve, Fonda's most notable films were Jezebel with Betty Davis, Young Mr. Lincoln, Jesse James, and arguably his most famous role as Tom Joad in The Grapes of Wrath, written by John Steinbeck. Fonda was nominated for an Oscar for that film. Charles Coburn plays Colonel Harrington. Coburn was a terrific character actor who always made his mark in every film he appeared in. He was late to start in films, and he was only a stage actor until his wife's death in 1937. It was then he moved to Hollywood and began his film career at the age of 50. Some of my favorite films with Coburn prior to The Lady Eve are Vivacious Lady with Ginger Rogers and James Stewart and Bachelor Mother, also with Ginger Rogers and David Niven. The director and screenwriter Preston Sturgis. Sturgis was one of the most talented screenwriters of his era. He began his career as an actor on Broadway in the late 1920s before transitioning into screenwriting for studios in Hollywood. He contributed his writing talents to films like The Original Invisible Man with, of course, Claude Rains, 20th Century with John Barrymore and Carol Lombard, and The Original Imitation of Life with Claudette Colbert. Two of my favorite films he wrote prior to The Lady Eve were Easy Living with Gene Arthur and Ray Moland and Remember the Night with Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. As was the case with many screenwriters throughout history, Sturgis was often unhappy with how directors handled his scripts. This was similar to Billy Wilder and eventually John Hughes, both of whom were brilliant screenwriters and they just decided to handle their own scripts by directing the films themselves. Sturgis' directorial debut was in 1940 with The Great McGinty with Brian Donnelly. He then followed up the same year with Christmas in July with Dick Powell. All right, the making of the film. So the lead role of Jean was supposed to be for Claudette Colbert in the initial development of the film back in 1939. Also, Sturgis' initial script was rejected by the Hayes office because of the quote-unquote, the definite suggestion of a sex affair between the two leads. Sturgis rewrote the script and it was, of course, accepted. Colbert dropped out and Paulette Goddard was supposed to take her place. That fell through and then, of course, it became Barbara Stanwyck. Fred McMurray and Joel McRae were in contention to play the Charles character, but when 20th Century Fox and Daryl Zanuck loaned out Henry Fonda, Fonda became the lead in the film. Okay, let's get into the film. So it begins with the opening credits that have a fun little cartoon snake who is wearing a top hat and playing the maracas with his tail while placing the title cards on the screen. The same snake continues to slither throughout the listing of the cast and crew. This is really well done and different from most classic opening credits at the time. 
Next, we see Charles Pike, which is Henry Fonda. He is an expert on snakes and reptiles and is wrapping up his current expedition in the Amazon jungle and returning home with his quote-unquote bodyguard, Muggsy, played by William Damaris. As it turns out, Pike is also the heir to a large fortune, and his family is wealthy from the brewery company. Charles takes his small boat from the Amazon to catch a large ocean liner, which will take him back home to New York. Because Charles is a bachelor, many women are eagerly waiting his arrival. However, two people in particular are the most ready for Charles. Colonel Harrington, Charles Coburn, and his daughter Jean, Barbara Stanwyck, who are two con artists looking to fleece rich men. Their next mark is, of course, Charles. That isn't a yacht, that's a tender. Well, what's a tender? I said pack. It was pike. So what? You put on your shorts. You can cry, can't you? Mom, it makes me puke. Puke? No, pike. Go put on your pick a Get down there and make fast. I ask. Gee, I hope he's rich. I hope he thinks he's a wizard of cards. And your lips to the ear of the Almighty. And I hope he's got a big fat wife so I don't have to dance in the moonlight with him. I don't know why it is, but a sucker always steps on your feet. A mug is a mug in everything. I don't see why I have to do all the dirty work. There must be plenty of rich old dames just waiting for you to push them around. You find them. I'll push them. Boy, would I like to see you giving some old harpy the three in one. Don't be vulgar, Jean. Let us be crooked but never common. <laughs> is he rich? As the purser so picturesquely put it, he's dripping with dough. He'd almost have to be to stop a boat. What does he own, Pike's Peak? Oh, no, no. Pike's Pale. The ale that won for Yale. I wonder if I could clunk him on the head with this. Don't do that. That night, Charles goes to the dining room to eat and is minding his own business reading a book on snakes. But every time he looks up, a different table of women are staring at him and smiling. All the while, Jean is doing the play-by-play for the entire charade. Two pints pale. Now, wait a minute. Six more pikes pale, make it snappy. What are you trying to do, embarrass me? We're all out of pikes. Work them over on something else. They don't want nothing else. They want the ale at one for Yale. Raw, raw, raw. Well, tell them to go to Harvard. Come on. Now, how many times do I have to tell you? Four pikes pale. Now, listen. Not good enough. What'd you say? I said they're not good enough for him. Every Jane in the room was giving him the thermometer and he feels they're just a waste of time. He's returning to his book. He's deeply immersed in it. He sees no one except... Watch his head turn when that kid goes by. Won't do you any good, dear. He's a bookworm, but swing him anyway. Oh, now how about this one? How would you like that hanging on your Christmas tree? Oh, you wouldn't? Well, what is your weakness, brother? Holy smoke, the drop kerchief. That hasn't been used since Lily Langtree. You'll have to pick it up yourself, madam. It's a shame that he doesn't care for the flesh. He'll never see it. Look at that girl over to his left. Look over to your left, bookworm. There's a girl pining for you. A little further. Just a little further. There. Wasn't that worth looking for? See those nice store teeth all beaming at you. Why, she recognizes you. She's up, she's down. She can't make up her mind, she's up again. She recognizes you. She's coming over to speak to you. The suspense is killing me. Why, for heaven's sake, aren't you fuzzy old hammer I went to manual training school with in Louisville? Oh, you're not? Well, you certainly look exactly like him. It's certainly a remarkable resemblance. But 
if you're not going to ask me to sit down, I suppose you're not going to ask me to sit down. I'm very sorry. I certainly hope I haven't caused you any embarrassment, you so-and-so. I wonder if my tie's on straight. I certainly upset them, don't I? Now, who else is after me? Ah, the lady champion wrestler. Wouldn't she make a houseful? Oh, you don't like her either. Well, what are you going to do about it? Oh, you just can't stand it anymore. You're leaving. These women don't give you a moment's peace, do they? Well, go ahead. Go sulk in your cabin. Go soak your head and see if I care. Very sorry, sir. That's all right. Why don't you look where you're going? Why don't I look? What you did to my shoe, you knocked the heel off. Oh, I did? Well, I'm certainly sorry. If you didn't, you can just take me right down to my cabin for another pair of slippers. Oh, well, certainly. I guess it's the least I can do. By the way, my name's Pike. Oh, everybody knows that. Nobody's talking about anything else. This is my father, Colonel Harrington. My name is Jean. It's really Eugenia. Come on. Funny our meeting like this, isn't it? Yes, isn't it? So Jean tripped Charles, and just like that, she has Charles on her arm. And then it's back to her cabin to get her a new pair of shoes. And it doesn't take long for Charles to become very smitten with Jean, no matter what kind of shy bookworm he really is. I hope I didn't hurt you. Of course you didn't. Don't you feel well? Oh, yeah, I'm all right. What were you doing up the Amazon? Looking for snakes. I'm an ophiologist. I thought you were in the beer business. Beer? Ale? What's the difference? Between beer and ale? Yes. My father burst a blood vessel if he heard you say that. There's a big difference. Ale's sort of fermented on the top or something, and beer's fermented on the bottom, or maybe it's the other way around. There's no similarity at all. See the trouble with being descended from a brewer, no matter how long ago he brewed it, or whatever you call it, you're supposed to know all about something you don't give a hoot about. It's funny to be kneeling here at your feet talking about beer. You see, I don't like beer. Bach beer, lager beer, or steam beer. Don't you? I do not, and I don't like pale ale, brown ale, nut brown ale, porter, or stout, which makes me ulp just to think about it. <laughs> Excuse me. But it was enough so everybody to call me Hopsy ever since I was six years old. Hopsy Pike. Hello, Hopsy. Make it Charlie, will you? <laughs> All right, but there's something kind of cute about Hopsy. And when you got older, I could call you Popsy. Hopsy Popsy. That's all I'd need. <laughs> Here's a business I wouldn't mind being in. I never realized before how lovely it could be. Oh, thank you. We better get back now. Yes, I guess so. You see, where I've been, I mean up the Amazon, you kind of forget how... I mean, when you haven't seen a girl in a long time. I mean, uh, something about that perfume that... Don't you like my perfume? Like it. I'm cockeyed on it. Why, Hopsy. You ought to be kept in a cage. Jean and Charles return to the dining room arm in arm to meet the colonel for drinks. While the women who were flirting with Charles before, they kind of stew with jealousy. The trio end up playing bridge for fun, or so Charles thinks, and the Harringtons let Charles win at first. At the end, the colonel acts like they were playing for money and gives Charles $600 in winnings. This is all part of the con, to make Charles think that the Harringtons are rich and want nothing to do with Charles's family fortune. The colonel excuses himself, and Jean decides to call it a night, as Charles swoons every time he gets close to Jean. He walks her back to her cabin, though he gets lost. Say, I'm afraid we're on the wrong deck. Well, isn't that a coincidence? Well, for heaven's sake, here's my cabin. Fantastic. <clears throat> Would you care to come in <clears throat> and see Emma? That's a new one, isn't it? <laughs> I want to wake her up. Wake who up? Emma. Emma? Who's Emma? I thought 
thought that was just a gag. Well, technically, she's a Colorina Mars Ditsy, which seems to be a rare type of Brazilian glass snake, which I'm... A snake? She seems to have got out again. She's out? Well, don't worry. She's around here someplace. Oh, oh let me out of here. Well, don't be frightened. She's just as playful as a kitten. You mustn't realize... Oh! Don't do that. How's that going? Oh! I'm terribly sorry. I wouldn't have frightened you for anything in the world. Why didn't you tell me you had a slimy... I thought you understood Emma was a snake. I don't understand anything of the kind. Why should I suspect an apparently civilized Please. man? Oh, look under the bed. How could she possibly get down here? Please. Oh, Please. all right. Oh. oh! It's just a stocking. Well, if you see any more, just leave them there. Now look in the bed. In the bed? How could she possibly... Oh, go on now. You know how fast we came down, so you can imagine. Oh! It's nothing, but it might have given you a shock. There's nothing like a cold hot water bottle. Oh, they would have had to bury me at sea. Oh, come over here and sit down beside me. Oh. oh comfortable? Yes, very. Oh, sorry. Oh, hold me tight. Oh, you don't know what you've done to me. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, that's all right. I wouldn't have frightened you for anything in the world. I mean, if there's anyone in the world I wouldn't have wanted to, it's you. Mm. You're very sweet. Don't let me go. Thank you. How was everything up the Amazon? All right, thank you. What are you thinking about? Nothing. Are you always going to be interested in snakes? Well, snakes are my life, in a way. What a life. No, I, I suppose it does sound sort of silly. I mean, I suppose I should have married and Settle down. I imagine my father always wanted me to. As a matter of fact, he's told me so rather plainly. I just never cared for the brewing business. Oh. You say that's why you've never married? Well, no, it's just I, I've never met her. I suppose she's around somewhere in the world. Uh, it would be too bad if you never bumped into each other. Well... I... I suppose you know what she looks like and everything? I think so. <laughs> I'll bet she looks like Marguerite and Faust. Oh, no, she isn't. I mean, she hasn't... She's not as bulky as an opera singer. Oh, how are her teeth? Huh? Well, you should always pick one out with good teeth. It saves expense later. Oh, well, now you're kidding. <laughs> not badly. You have a right to have an idea. Oh, I guess we all have one. What does yours look like? He's a little short guy with lots of money. Why short? What does it matter if he's rich? It's so he'll look up to me, so I'll be his ideal. That's a funny kind of reasoning. Well, look who's reasoning. And when he takes me out to dinner, he'll never add up the check, and he won't smoke greasy cigars or use grease on his hair. And, oh, yes, he, he won't do card tricks. Oh. Oh, it's not that I mind your doing card tricks, Hopsy. It's just that you naturally wouldn't want your ideal to do card tricks. I shouldn't think that kind of ideal was so difficult to find. Oh, he isn't. That's why he's my ideal. What's the sense of having one if you can't ever find him? Mine is a practical idea. You can find two or three of in every barbershop getting the works. Oh, why don't you marry one of them? Why should I marry anybody that looked like that? When I marry, it's going to be somebody I've never seen before. I mean, I won't know what he looks like or where he'll come from or what he'll be. I want him to sort of take me by surprise. Like a burglar. That's right. And the night will be heavy with perfume. And I'll hear a step behind me. And somebody breathing heavily. And then... Oh. Oh. 
You better go to bed, Hopsy. I think I can sleep peacefully now. I wish I could say the same. Why, Hopsy? <laughs> so Jean's plan is working like a charm. She's really got Charles wrapped around her finger. The next morning, Charles tells Muggsy that he's going to lose back the $600 to Jean and her father. Muggsy is naturally suspicious of the Harringtons and thinks it's all of a ruse. Charles is completely naive and so smitten with Jean, he can't bring himself to think that he might be getting conned. So Charles decides to ask Jean for breakfast. Good morning. Thank you for the roses. Gee, you look pretty. I hope you slept well. I'm still a little jumpy. How is that, uh, Emma? She's just having breakfast. What does she eat? Don't tell me. <laughs> no, I won't. <gasps> I hope you didn't mind my asking you to breakfast. Well, it wouldn't be very polite if I said I did, would it? No, I don't suppose it would. And it wouldn't be true either. You have the darndest way of bumping a fella down and bouncing him up again. And then bumping him down again. Um, I was just going to say I could imagine life with you being a series of ups and downs, lights and shadows, some irritation, but very much happiness. Why, Hopsy, are you proposing to me so soon? No, of course not. Oh, I'm just... Well, then you ought to be more careful. People have been sued for much less. Well, not by girls like you. <laughs> don't you know it's dangerous to trust people you don't know very well? Well, I know you very well. No, I mean people you haven't known very long. Oh, I've known you a long time, in a way. Breakfast, sir? What did you say? I said breakfast, sir. Two scotch and sodas with plain water. You take it plain, don't you? Don't you take cream and sugar in it? No, I always drink it black. Oh. See, what am I talking about? <laughs> That's what I was wondering. How about a nice bicarbonate of soda with an egg in it? It does wonders. He doesn't understand. <laughs> in the meantime, the colonel and his associate Gerald, played by Melville Cooper, are preparing to take Charles to the cleaners in another game of cards. Do you want the strippers on the right or the left? I hardly need them, Gerald. I can take this boy with a deck of visiting cards. Just to be on the safe side. High card cuts on the outside, cold hands in the middle. Cold hands I love. Ta -da 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 -da. Blue readers on the outside, red nearest the heart. I could play the whole ship with these. Hello, Harry. Hello, Gerald. Hello, Jean. Greetings, my little minx. I hope I find you well and that your little pal hasn't fallen overboard. Well, that's $600. He's all right. He's just gone to dress for dinner. Then I think you'd better do the same because we are going to play a little cards tonight and I don't mean old maid. I think Charles is in love with me. No. Yeah. Of course he's in love with you. Who is he not to be in love with you who beautified the North Atlantic? Mm -hmm. Better man than he. No, I mean on the level, Harry. Are you suggesting that the others were on the bias? Oh, stop kidding. I'm not kidding. I was never more delighted. You have as usual taken... No, no, you don't get the point. I like him, too. Why shouldn't you like him? There's as fine a specimen of the sucker sapiens as I've ever seen. There's a man who does card tricks. There's a... I think he's going to ask me to marry him. No. No. Yes. But that's wonderful, Jean. No wonder you are blushing. <laughs> and that fortunate young man. Fortunate indeed. Can't you hear his pulses pounding? His ears must be ringing like telephone bells. His hands are clammy with excitement. You won't know an ace from a deuce. You weren't thinking of taking him, Harry. Well, what were you thinking of? I don't think you understand, either of you. This is on the up and up. I... I think I'm in love with the poor fish. Snakes and all. Oh, I don't know. He's, he's kind of touched something in my heart. And I'd give a lot to be. Well, I mean, I, I'm going to be exactly the way he thinks I am. The way he'd like me to be. I'm sure that's very noble, Jean. And I wish you all the happiness in the world. All the little boys and all the little girls you want. And you'll go straight too, won't you, Harry? Straight to where? Oh, you know what I mean. You can come and live with us. And you too, Gerald. Well, part of the time, anyway. We'll probably have a very beautiful place. And think how peaceful you can be. Playing cribbage with Gerald. I can just see myself roaming around your estate with a weed sticker and 50 cents a week. And a pair of new slippers for Christmas. The trouble with people who reform is they always want to rain on everybody else's parade, too. Harry. You tend to your knitting. I'll play the cards. Not with him. Do you happen to remember that sucker has $500 of ours in his pocket? $600. Oh, I suppose you could take that back. You bet I could, and a little dividend along with it. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. You'll find out I can play a little cards myself. You think so? I know so. I'm not your daughter for free, you know. Give me a pack of those. You'll find out. 
Children don't respect their parents anymore. Well, this is a new wrinkle. Jean actually can't help but like Charles because she's never met anyone like him, someone that generally likes her. But it's going to be tough to change your father's con artist ways. Well, I haven't been quite as lucky tonight as usual, have I? You don't know how lucky you've been. The Colonel has been drawing wonderful cards. I believe it's my deal. I'm sorry. I guess I haven't got my mind on the game. I noticed that. How much are you behind? Oh, about $3,000. Well, 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 you've given me a good hand at last. I'm glad you like it. Well, you'll have to be pretty good to beat me, sir. I'll open for a hundred. Nevertheless, I'll raise you a hundred. Too good for me. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to raise you a hundred. Well, you must have something pretty good. Still, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Still, I'll raise you a hundred. I'm sorry to see you lose your money, sir, but I can't let that challenge go unanswered. And a hundred. You're making me very nervous. But. I must raise you 200. Pike doesn't know the meaning of the word fear. And 100. Harrington doesn't know the meaning of the word defeat. And 200. What are you doing? Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought I'd given you six cards. Far from it, my little minx. Far from it. And 100. Gracious, I wonder if I have enough money with me. Oh, yes, plenty, plenty. I'll raise you a thousand. I don't want to win so much from you, but I'll call just to show you how hopeless it is. Cards? Not unless you have another queen, which I doubt. I'll see what I can do. Well, what do you know about that? I thought at least one of you had four aces. I'll check my four queens, sir. What of you? I regret to say that I was bluffing. Spare me the shame of showing you on what. Oh, say, I'm embarrassed. Maybe I should have laid my cards down. Oh, you don't think he minds, do you? Your father loves to lose. <laughs> so this last scene was great, but it was a lot of visual. So Jean dealt four queens to Charles and gave her father nothing. However, the colonel decides to cough into his handkerchief, which happened to have four kings stashed in there. Knowing what her father is up to, Jean palms his card when he places them on the table when raising the bets. The colonel then goes into his wallet to raise the bet further and magically finds four aces. However, Jean again knows her father's trick and therefore at the end throws down an ace. The colonel has to fold at this point knowing if he shows his hand, it would be impossible for him to have four aces unless he was cheating. It's just a great scene. I'll meet you on A deck in five minutes, but I want your word of honor that you won't play even one more hand. You have it. Know any more games, Harry? Mm. Wonderful girl. Yes, isn't she? I, uh... I don't know whether you noticed, but, uh... If you have no objections, it was... It was my intention to, uh... Ask Miss Harrington, I mean your daughter, to, uh... <coughs> be mine. Why, my dear boy, you see me astonished. Why, that was the last thing that entered my mind. Bless my soul, let's have a drink on that. Stuart, two drinks. Well, I'm all emotional. Thank you, sir. To say that I am thunderstruck is an understatement. She'll probably turn you down, but anyway... I intend to make her as happy as I can. Well, she asks very little. I suppose you know I'm very rich. Aren't we all? I'm sorry in a way because it would be so pleasant to my lovely nonsense that for somebody who never had them. Wouldn't it? That's the tragedy of the rich. They don't need anything. You know, as a matter of fact, Charles, I don't even like winning a thousand dollars from you. Oh, my dear sir, it isn't a drop in the ocean. 
Why, every time the clock ticks, 14 people swig a bottle of Pike. I don't know why, but there you are. It's the principle of the thing that bothers me, a father who wins from his own son-in-law. How does that look? Here, let's wipe out that douse. Double or nothing. Well, I promised Gene I wouldn't play anymore. This isn't playing. This is undoing an absurdity. Here, thousand dollars. High card takes it. Go ahead. Well? Darn it all. Now we'll have to try again. That's two thousand I owe you. For the moment. you wouldn't do that. I'm sure if you tried once more. No, thanks. I'd rather pay 32000 than lose a really large amount. This is very embarrassing. Just make it out to cash. It could be even more embarrassing. 32000 dollars and no cents. Don't mention the middle name. I wouldn't want Gene to know it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I prefer if you wouldn't tell Gene anything about the whole transaction. You may depend upon it. You certainly may. You promised me you wouldn't play anymore. Oh, well, we didn't play anymore, Gina. We, we were just wiping out my loss. You need a keeper. Now that you've taught Charles not to play devil or nothing, what are you going to do with that check? Just this, my pretty child. You mean it was just a joke? Why, of course. You don't actually think I'd bleed my own daughter's friend, do you? Perish the thought. Come on. Good night. Your check, sir. And Gene to the rescue. The two walk out to the deck to talk. I spoke to your father about something. Did you? Yes. Would you like to go up in the bow of the boat and stand in the wind? I'd love to. Makes you feel all clean inside and nice. Don't move. What? I've just understood something. You see, every time I've looked at you here on the boat, it wasn't only here I saw you. You seem to go way back. I know that isn't clear, but I, I saw you here and at the same time further away and then still further away and then very small, like converging perspective lines. No, that isn't it. It's like, like people following each other in a forest blade. Only way back there, you're a little girl with short dresses and your hair falling to your shoulders. And a little boy is standing with you, holding your hand. In the middle distance, I'm still with you, not holding your hand anymore because it isn't manly, but wanting to. And then still further, we look terrible. You with your legs like a colt and mine like a calf. What I'm trying to say is, well, I'm not a poet, I'm an ophiologist. I've always loved you. I mean, I've never loved anyone but you. I know that sounds dull as a drugstore novel, and what I see inside I'll never be able to cast into words, but that's what I mean. I wish we were married and on our honeymoon now. So do I. But it isn't as simple as all that, Hopsy. I'm terribly in love, and you seem to be too, so one of us has to think and try and keep things clear. Maybe I can do that better than you can. They say a moonlit deck is a woman's business office. While Charles and Jean are head over heels for each other, Muggsy thinks that Charles is still in danger of getting swindled by card sharks and continues to f- try to find some dirt on the Harringtons. Jean and her father speak briefly in their cabin. Jean again tells her dad she loves Charles and wants to drop the con life and marry Charles. The colonel asks if she'll come clean with Charles before they're married. She says she will, and the colonel asks that she wait until after they leave the ship. This will allow him and Gerald to escape of sorts. Unfortunately, Muggsy and the captain of the ship spill the beans before Gene can talk to Charles. What's the matter? Did you lose? The guy lets me win a few fish for a change. So you get twice as suspicious, huh? That's right. 
You ought to put handles on that skull, maybe you can grow geraniums in it. Yeah? Well, get a load of this and see what you can grow in it. Gratitude. That's what you get by saving a guy's life. Vital Vance. If you didn't happen to lose any money last night, Mr. Pike, I would prefer you didn't look in there. I didn't lose any. Then there is only one other possibility. They might be aiming at higher gain. What are you talking about? You haven't fallen in love, have you? What's it got to do with you? Look at the photograph. I'll take the consequences. Good morning, sir. girl in the middle of an ocean? You see, Hopsy, you don't know very much about girls. The best ones aren't as good as you probably think they are, and the bad ones aren't as bad. Not nearly as bad. So I suppose you're right to worry, falling in love with an adventuress in the high seas. Are you an adventuress? Of course I am. All women are. They have to be. If you waited for a man to propose to you from natural causes, you'd die of old maidenhood. That's why I let you try my slippers on, and then I put my cheek against yours. And I made you put your arms around me. And then I... I fell in love with you. Which wasn't in the cards. Jean. Yes, darling. What's that? You better look. Rotten likeness, isn't it? I never cared for that picture. Good morning, Miss Harrington. Breakfast, melon, grapefruit, orange juice. Get some coffee, please. Yes, indeed. Please don't look so upset, darling. I was going to tell you when we got to New York. I would have told you last night, only it wouldn't have been fair to Harry and Gerald. I mean, you, you never know how someone's going to take things like that, and... Well... Maybe I wanted you to love me a little more, too. You believe me, don't you? You don't think I was going to marry you without telling you. You don't think that badly of me. Or do you? Why didn't you let your father rob me last night? I didn't believe what I just told you. You wouldn't believe that. Since I, some of the last quip was visual, there's a note on the photos that the captain gave Charles, which said, Handsome Harry Harrington, his daughter Jean, and then the third character known as Gerald. They're professional card sharks, also bunco, oil wells, gold mines, and occasional green goods. Harrington's also known as Dr. Hersher, Major D.D. Brown, the Reverend Dr. Upswitch, Captain Julius Joyce Retired, and C.K.J. Melvern. He also poses as a dentist. Jean goes back to her cabin heartbroken, though feels in some ways that this is all of her past catching up with her, and maybe she doesn't deserve someone who's honest. 
Instead of saying sad, she decides to be mad for letting herself fall for the initial mark. And her father has a surprise for her. He actually didn't tear up the $32,000 check that Charles wrote to cash. He actually crumpled it, palmed it, and then tore another piece of paper that wasn't the check when he was at the table initially with Charles. Once off the boat, Jean, her father, and Gerald go to a racetrack to bet on the horses. It's there they meet another associate they used to know for their cons, played by Eric Bloor, who is now going by Sir Alfred. There are only five horses in the race. What do you expect when you bet on a goat called after you? Um, pardon me, but is this seat taken? My dear Harry, bless my soul. William at the moment. William, of course. I'm enchanted to see you again, my dear William. And you, Gerald, and the little lady is pretty as a pack of aces. Hello, Pirelli. Sir Alfred at the moment, my pretty child. Sir Alfred McGlennon Keith at your service. Well, you're certainly a sight for lame peepers. Do you know I've seen nobody, absolutely not a soul, now a set, of course, I mean, since the boat stopped running. What's your pitch, Pearlie? Sir Alfred, I have a little nest on the edge of a town called Bridgefield, a town that's full of millionaires. Is in the heart of the contract bridge belt. A wonderful game. Bridgefield, Connecticut? Precisely. I have my dogs, I have my horses, I have my little house, I have my antiques. We play a little game here and a little game there, and then we play somewhere else. Sometimes my luck is good, sometimes my luck is better. But what was one thing and another, my dear chap? Oh, oh what a dream. How do you meet them? The chumps. Oh, my dear fellow, when one's name is Sir Alfred McGlennon Keith RFD, one doesn't have to meet them, one fights them off with sticks. And then again, just think. There's no hurry. You have them by the year, like a lease. Ah, oh, Pearlie. Tell me, uh, do you know the Pikes? What do you care if he does? Oh, do I know them? I positively swill in their ale. Good old Horace. Oh, what a card player. Do you know Charles? Oh, is he the tall backward boy who's always toying with toads and things? Yes, I think I have seen him skulking about. He isn't backward. He's a scientist. Oh, is that what it is? Oh, well, I knew he was peculiar. Well, it's charming to have seen you again. Now, what have we in the fifth? Say, Pearlie. Yeah? Could I visit you sometime? Could you visit me sometime? As your niece. As my niece? My dear girl, there's only one thing. We have to be English. I've I? been English before. I shall be as English as necessary. Why don't you stop talking nonsense? Because I want to see that guy. I've got some unfinished business with him. I need him like the axe needs the turkey. So Sir Alfred sets up a dinner with the Pikes, in which his niece, the Lady Eve, will accompany him. The Pikes have no clue who Jean is, and Charles is going to be in for quite a shock. Charles's father is played by the great character actor Eugene Powett, who has a very distinctive voice. He actually played the original Friar Tuck in Errol Flynn's version of Robin Hood. So I said, do you think I'd do better on a tram? And he said, well, now, uh, uh, you couldn't do worse. <laughs> <laughs> so I thanked him and returned to the street. Oh, but I must say, I felt an awful fool. <laughs> well, how did you get here? I took a taxi. You're from New York? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, I want you to meet Lady Eve Sidwick. How do you do? Uh, go on, go on. Oh, the chauffeur said I watched the phone. I said, very well, but I must say, the city seemed enormous. <laughs> 20 cents a mile. <laughs> Isn't your son feeling well? What's the matter with you? Well, uh, I mean to say, uh, haven't we met? But of course we have. Your father just introduced us. Aren't you feeling well? Uh, <laughs> sure. Oh, I'm so sorry. You meant, hadn't you met me before someplace? Yeah. Oh, very probably. Let me see, where could it have been? Uh, Deauville. No. Bialitz? No. I know Lituke. You had a moustache at the time and you tried to beat me at a dance in the casino. No. Huh? I give up. Well, let's have a drink. It couldn't have been on the SS Southern Queen between here and South America, could it? Oh, I'm afraid not. You see, I've never been in South America. You've never been in South America. She's never been in South America. As a matter of fact, I've never been in North America until about three days ago. Oh, you haven't? Oh, well, you weren't on the SS Southern Queen. Hey, what's the matter with you? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, were you in love with her? Yeah, he was in love with her, but he don't remember what she looked like. <laughs> <laughs> don't let them tease you. You can tell me all about her. <laughs> well, on some days, my son seems brighter than others. <laughs> well, I don't know what she looked like, but if she looked anything like you, here's to her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
was a white one with enormous teeth. Dinner is served, madam. Thank you very much. Dinner, Horace. Oh, come on, let's put on the feed bag. Take my arm and we'll slide our way through. <laughs> Charming, simply charming. <laughs> I just... <laughs> you haven't been hitting the bottle lately, of have you? Of course he hasn't. Anybody's apt to trip. Not over a sofa. That sofa's been there for 15 years, and no one ever fell over it before. Oh, well, now the ice is broken. You go upstairs and take a bath, and I'll like you just as much as ever. There's a good boy. Toodaloo. So long. So while Charles makes a fool of himself tripping over all the furniture, Muggsy tries to talk some sense into Charles by confirming that the Lady Eve is, of course, Jean Harrington, and not to fall for the con. Charles changes into a new suit and goes back down for dinner, though he's not sure if it's really Jean or not. Yeah. I remember a night in Bombay. Have you ever been in Bombay? Or just there? Have you ever been in Bombay? I've been in Egypt. Well, I remember a night in Egypt, for that matter. I was in the dark bear with a small party of friends. One day while shooting crocodiles... You missed some there, very nice suit. It's too bad. The fish was a poem. Yeah. It's fine. Did you hear how the Lady Eve got to this country? No. Oh. You must promise not to tell a soul. I won't. In a submarine. No. Is that so? Yeah. Do you know that I find your son very handsome? No. Yes, quite. What's this? Why don't you look where you're going? Why don't you keep your nose out of other people's business? Listen, Why? fish eye, for two cents I'd smack oh, you and... Tush, tush. Yeah. Why don't you look with? Here, give me that. What do you mean? Come on. Very harmless. So the deaf man said, what did you say? And the other passenger said, I hear you buried your wife. <laughs> <laughs> so the deaf man said, I didn't quite hear you. Oh. Over here. What do you think you're doing in the dining room? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm so sorry, sir. It's about time. And then the other passenger said, yeah. Come on, ladies first. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought he was passing it to go on. <laughs> you throw that rough neck out of here, or will I have to? With enthusiasm, sir. That's the same day, I can tell by the I'll way. I'll take over from here, Mr. Murgatroyd. You and who else? I said I'll take over from here, Ambrose. Ambrose? I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I said I'll take over from here. You have no right now. I
Did you purchase it locally? It's the last one. Anything happens to this, I'll have to wear a bath towel. Oh, don't let it depress you, laddie. Worst things happen in the best families. I remember an incident in Calcutta. I hope your niece doesn't I... think I'm a hat with. Oh, bumble puppy. Why, she's used to having young men fall for her. <laughs> you know, I think that's rather neat for a nobleman. Uh, no, it's just that this girl on the boat. Oh, there was a girl on the boat? She looks so exactly like your niece. Shh. Did she have the McGlennon eyes, the cornflower blue? Oh, I think so. Then you must never mention a word of this to a soul. What do you mean? Shh! Rattling the skeleton in our family closet. I'm afraid you've stumbled on the sorrow of Sidwich, the secret of the century. Well, I don't quite follow. Shh! Meet me in yonder window embrasure and look as though you know nothing. Okay, so Charles is now on his third tuxedo and still not sure if Eve is really Jean. So what is Jean's endgame here? Is she just trying to embarrass Charles as much as possible, or does she still have feelings for him? Not to spoil anything, but the party is not the end of the film. There's about 20 minutes left and plenty of madcap antics that still occur, and the ending is very satisfying. The Lady Eve is one of the best screwball comedies ever made, written by one of the most talented screenplay writers in film history. And if you match that with the talents of Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda and a terrific supporting cast, the film is one that gets better and better with every subsequent viewing, just as Leonard Maltin stated in his short review. All right, some fun facts. So the film was nominated for an Oscar for Best Original Story, but it actually lost to Here Comes Mr. Jordan, which is another terrific film that I own. Preston Sturgis wrote the screenplay specifically for Barbara Stanwyck. He had promised her a great film while working on a previous movie. This is likely why Claudette Colbert and Paulette Goddard were eventually replaced. Preston Sturges also wrote the script in Reno, Nevada while awaiting his third divorce. With so many people on the set, Sturges dressed eccentrically so that he would stand out. He either wore a brightly colored beret or a hat with a feather in it. This led to him being dubbed the worst dressed man in Hollywood. Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda rarely retired to their dressing rooms between takes. Instead, they hung out with Preston Sturgis, listening to his stories and reviewing and often rewriting their lines. Henry Fonda brought his young daughter Jane on set for her fourth birthday party during the filming. Paramount was so pleased with Sturgis' first two directorial efforts and his work on this film that the studio gave him a more lucrative contract at the end of 1940, paying him $2,750 a week for his work as a writer and then a $30,000 bonus for each film he directed. And he actually earned more than $200,000 in 1940, which is a huge sum, especially back then. All right, I do have a radio adaptation from March 9th, 1942, from the Lux Radio Theater, which features Ray Land in the Henry Fonda role. But Barbara Stanwyck and Charles Coburn reprise their roles, so you'll get to hear that after we talk to one of our resident movie buffs and classic movie buffs, Samantha, who sees this movie for the first time, so we get her fresh take on the film, and then afterwards, I'll play the radio adaptation. And I'll be back next week with yet another random film from a DVD collection. Okay, we are back with Samantha. Welcome back. Hello. Okay, so we're going to talk about The Lady Eve with Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda. And what's funny is not too long ago, we talked about Ball of Fire, which was also in the same year. And there's a lot of similarities, I think, between that film, at least least their character, that is, and and this film. So right off the bat, which one do you prefer, actually, Ball of Fire or Lady Eve? Yeah. Oh, they were so similar. Um, I kind of put two and two together. I think when I was done watching The Lady Eve and I was like, you know what? That reminds me a lot of <laughs> Fall of Fire. Um, I think I liked The Lady Eve more. Okay. I just loved her sneaky, very confident, uh, con lady character. <laughs> yeah, and that's a perfect way to put it. <laughs> yeah, she was so just elegant and everyone she conned everyone i i loved it just she could talk about anything and she was so entertaining um and i thought the the, yeah the structure of the story was clever too well i think that was the genius of preston sturgis who who started as a screenwriter he he wrote this film as well but this is one he directed um, and I think if you like this, you'll like a lot of his his films because they have kind of that that sharp wit to them. And mm-hmm. uh, so Very you obviously, sharp. Yeah. yeah, which is great. And so I, so you must have liked her father, Charles Coburn, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took me honestly a little while to figure out what was going on. Mm-hmm. I kind of was 
tricked at the beginning. Like I mm. thought they were just, you know, traveling and she was a rich lady who wanted to just pick up a rich husband. It took right. me a while to figure out that this was part of a larger game. Maybe I, I missed the beginning. I wasn't paying close enough attention. But yeah, her father, the quote, Colonel, yeah, exactly. was so he was very, you know, sly yeah. and kind of subtly funny. It, it was just it was an interesting combo because the where I've seen him before, he kind of plays this type of character usually. But right, right. This time had that not like evil side, but I can't come up with the correct adjective that he was just a little more, um, more conniving than usual. Conniving, maybe. yeah. yeah. <laughs> conniving, but still funny and like a little sweet too. Yeah. So yeah, he, it was a good character. Well, I think the best scene, and there's a lot of good scenes, but the card um, when they're when they're playing cards, when yeah, he's, <laughs> and she and and um, Eve help, helps out or Jean uh, helps out with. Uh, she could see that uh, Henry Fond is getting taken, and mm-hmm. she knows exactly what's happening. And there, and it's kind of that cat and mouse between her and yeah. her father. Yeah, yeah, they both were playing their own game. She had her goals, and he really is just driven by the money. Yep. So, I think, yeah, she found a way to win in the end. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and so, in that part too. So, oh, totally. And so we know for I know from the past of how you feel towards certain characters. How did you feel about Henry Fonda's character? <laughs> because he seems like the type of person when he constantly makes the same mistakes over and over oh. again, it bothers you. So how did you feel about him? He, this character is so dopey. <laughs> That's the only word I can think of to describe him. But I think similar to in Ball of Fire with, um, oh gosh, who... Garrett, was it Gary Cooper? Gary Cooper. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was th- that same character of a very book smart man mm-hmm. that was like kind of the nerd of the time. Right. Um, well, I guess now you could say it would be like similar to like a computer geek or yeah, techie. like a techie guy. Yeah. But then exactly. it was a bookworm who studied yeah. <laughs> mis- exactly. snakes mm-hmm. and kind of had the had was a smart guy rich guy but just it wasn't all there (laughs) and i think they tried to blame it on the fact that he was in the forest rainforest for a year Mm -hmm. um but he he didn't bug me too much honestly he seemed kind of um like a genuine person and i did roll my eyes after he fell for like the 10th time and got like food knocked all over him. Um, I was like, okay, I think we've done that joke enough. Yeah. Um, But no, I think his character was, I think, charming and like sweet enough where I kind of could overlook how dumb he was at that point. (laughs) I was like, come on, kind of get, get a clue here. (laughs) Well, it was okay. (laughs) So what's interesting about it, he's so naive about, yeah, his fondness of Jean, uh, that that's why she eventually falls for him is because yeah. the first time that he's, uh, she's met someone that's genuine towards her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and then the, you know, when he finds out what's actually going on, they becomes that, that back and forth. And then she then really puts on the con, um, when she when it turns into the lady. Eve. So how did you like the transition of that? Like, did you like how this story kind of progressed and, and how it all played out? I did. I did. I wasn't sure what they were going to do with this. I thought the initial plot would play out the whole time. Like they were, you know, meet on their, on this journey and he would maybe find out about what her, her life. And then they would get, you know, back together or whatever. But Mm -hmm. I was not expecting the, like, it was about halfway through. I was not expecting the you know, full breakup. And then she would have to transform her identity again. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought that was smart. And it kept me really enthralled in the plot. And it was, of course, very just kind of a crazy concept that now she's an English lady. Right. (laughs) Um, But 
I think it was funny too. Like they were trying to show that she could just, you know, if she pretends to be this aristocrat, these rich people will accept her right in and they'll believe everything she says. Right. And it was a smart play on her part to get close to um, Charles again, even though that second time around, she kind of went in with bad intentions. Yeah, exactly. So the um, originally this was meant for Claudette Colbert, who I think would have been very good in this this role too. But it's again, it's hard to imagine anyone else but Barbara Stanwyck playing the role. Yeah. Oh, she was great. She is, I love how quick she is and how she carries herself. And I think it was a perfect combo. Yeah. This movie. Now, uh, would you have picked someone else to play the male role? So instead of Henry Fonda, would you pick someone else? You know what? Like, I have not really seen too much of Henry Fonda, I Hmm. think, because I generally don't gravitate toward the movies. He's like the genre that he typically plays. Sure. Um, So I liked him in this movie. I thought that he was a good fit because I think his look is, you know, he's tall, good looking, comes from this rich family. But Mm -hmm. I thought he also played the, yeah, the naive dorky guy in a way it it worked (laughs) for me it worked for me i i'm like uh cary grant's a huge fan of cary grant and i love any screwball he's in so i think he could have played this too but i think he fits more of the like maybe euro british roles a bit better um much more suave yeah and Mm -hmm. so i think uh, Henry Fonda was a good choice for like that all American like guy. So mm-hmm. it was good. I thought the casting was great overall. Yeah. I think like if it was him, if it was Cary Grant, if it was Clark Gable, I think it, nobody would believe it because uh-huh. they, he, they don't think of them as bookish at all. Even though yeah. actually in bringing up baby, Cary Grant's kind of bookish in that. So yeah, yeah Cary Grant could pull true. off everything, you know? Yeah, he can, he can. But I don't know. I couldn't picture him as like the heir to like a beer. Yeah, right. Or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and like once you see the family that he comes from, I'm like, okay. I thought, yeah, the casting was casting was good. So had you seen this before or was this the first time? No, I had not seen this. I think I got it mixed up with something else. Okay. Um, but no, I had never seen this. It was a complete fresh watch and I really enjoyed it. Well, good, because I, we're about to go on a run of Preston Sturgis movies. So if you like this one, you're oh, probably going to like the cool. others as well. Is there anything about this you would have changed, like the plot wise or, or anything? Or you, were you just perfectly happy with the way everything went? I was happy. I didn't have any immediate reservations or thoughts as to things I would change. Yeah, I thought that it was paced really well. The sections were just the right amount of time. Um, And I thought it wrapped up smartly. Um, I didn't think it would really, I don't want to give too much away, but (laughs) yeah, I thought how it resolved, if you could call it that, was also really clever. And that's how I would, I I like movies ending. It wasn't drawn out. Mm -hmm. We didn't have like long speeches and explanations. Right. It's just a nice, succinct conclusion and everything. I think it all ended up how it should. I think Henry Fonda's character, Charles, is still a bit dumb, but that was <laughs> that was the funny part. I think the the naive men getting um taken advantage of by um Jean slash Eve. I think that was one of the kind of underlying themes here um and yeah that always that makes me happy when that happens <laughs> yeah and, well yeah and that's what's fun about this movie is because you're rooting for the the con artist because yeah. you and that's i think the brilliance of of that writing that character and also the way she pulls it off that you root for the you know either the criminal or the con artist and, and that's that's a nice balance if yeah. you can do that yeah 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 and it was cute at the same time yeah somehow <laughs> it all right well that's uh, that's why screwball comedies back in the day were were so great yeah 
Yeah, yeah they're uh, awesome. Well, thank you for doing this. And uh, I, I have a feeling another Preston Sturgis uh, movie is Great. going to be uh, in your future. So. <laughs> sure. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Samantha. Okay, bye. Luck presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Barbara Stanwyck, Ray Milland, and Charles Corbin in The Lady Eve. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, the Lux Radio Theater will be curtailed to 45 minutes so that we may all hear the President of the United States, Vice President Wallace, and Secretary of Agriculture, Wickert. Keep tuned to this station, and you'll be sure to hear them. Now, compared to what Barbara Stanwyck does to Ray Milland in tonight's play, The Lady Eve, the woes of Adam seem like the life of Riley. Eve used an apple. Miss Stanwyck, aided and abetted by Charles Coburn, uses a deck of cards, a treacherous disguise, and a tropic moon. After what Barbara did with this blitzkrieg combination in the Paramount picture, Ray Milan should be forewarned of what's ahead of him tonight. But the Lady Eve gets her just desserts. She may be a card shop, but she's helpless when love deals aces from the bottom of the deck. This time every year, I take on a little extra job. One that seems to go very well with producing pictures and radio plays, and also with Lux Toilet Soap. Schools and colleges all over the country send photographs of the girls in their graduating classes and ask me to pick the most beautiful. A very simple request, but not easy to answer. At first glance, it usually looks like a tie. In those cases, I suspect that all the girls have been using Lux toilet soap since they were able to talk. And a girl can say, Lux, very young. Now the curtain and the first act of the Lady Eve. Starring Barbara Stanwyck as Jean Harrington, Ray Milland as Charles Pike, and Charles Coburn as Colonel Harrington. He's coming on board now, Charles Pike. There he is, Myrtle, Charles Pike himself. Who's he, Mama? What do you care? He's worth a fortune and he's single. Go put on your shorts. The catch of the season is just coming aboard the steamship Southern Queen anchored at the mouth of the Amazon. Returning from a scientific expedition in the Brazilian jungle, young and single Charles Pike climbs the ship's ladder, and every mother with an eligible daughter gives him a sickening smile. At the rail of the boat are Colonel Harrington and his daughter, Jean. The Colonel and Jean, however, are not interested in marrying the Pike fortune. They have a better way to get it. A very likely prospect, my dear. Yeah, I hope he thinks he's a wizard at cards. My fingers are itching already. Maybe I ought to go to the cabin and fix up a nice cold deck. I wish he had a fat wife so I wouldn't have to dance in the moonlight with him. I don't know why it is, but a sucker always steps on your feet. A mug is a mug in everything. I don't see why I have to do all the dirty work. There must be plenty of rich old dames just waiting for you to push them around. Don't be vulgar, Jean. Let us be crooked, but never common. Ah, here's Gerald. Gerald! Oh, there you are. Well, Gerald, did you get the low down on him? Oh, yes, sir, I did. Sir. Come on, Gerald, forget the butler act. Is the sucker rich? As the purser so picturesquely put it, the sucker is dripping with dough. Good. What does he own, Pike's Peak? Oh, no, 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 no. Pike's Pale, the ale that won for Yale. Bartender, another bottle of Pike's, please. Pike's Ale, please. Please, uh, two more pipes, Dale. Straighten your scenes, darling. Oh, why, of course, I mean, just very, very interesting. Look at them ordering ale. Every dame at the bar is going to pass out with galloping hiccups. They don't seem to be making much of an impression on Mr. Pike. I think it's time you got acquainted with him, my dear. Look at that girl over to his left. Look over to your left, sucker. See those nice store teeth all beaming at you? No, nope, she doesn't like them. Now he's getting up to go. He's coming this way, Jean. Move your chair back, Harry. I'm going to trip him on his face. You think that's a good way to meet him? Well, nobody else is getting any place. Look out. Here he is. Oh! Oh! Oh, why don't you look where you're going? Why don't I look? 
You stuck out your foot. And... Look what you did to my shoe. You knocked the heel off. Oh, I did? Well, I'm certainly sorry. If you didn't, you can take me right down to my cabin for another pair of slippers. Oh, well, I guess it's the least I can do. By the way, my name is Pike. Oh, everybody knows that. Nobody's talking about anything else. This is my father, Colonel Harrington. My name is Gene. It's really Eugenia. My cabin's down this way. Come on. Say, this is quite a cabin you've got here. Yes. Pretty cozy, isn't it? Yeah. Say. Something burning? Holy Moses. What's the matter? <sighs> that perfume. What's the matter with it? Oh, nothing. It's just that I've been up the Amazon for a year and they don't use perfume. It smells good. Oh. The shoes are over here in the trunk. And because you were so polite, you can pick them out and put them on if you like. Put them on? You? Well, not on you. Go ahead. Holy Moses, look at all those shoes. <laughs> See anything you like? Yeah. Gosh, it doesn't seem possible for anybody to wear anything this size. Oh, oh that's pretty. Uh, you'll have to kneel down, Mr. Pike. Hmm? To put them on me. Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's right. You know, you should have been a shoe salesman. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't you feel well? Oh, I, I'm all right. Hmm. Tell me, what were you doing up the Amazon? Uh, looking for snakes. I'm an ophiologist. I thought you were in the beer business. Beer? Ale. What's the difference? Between beer and ale? Yes. Listen, my father would burst a blood vessel if he heard you say that. There's a big difference. Ale sort of fermented on the top or something, and beer's fermented on the bottom, or maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, there's no similarity at all. Oh. You know, it's, it's funny to be kneeling here at your feet talking about beer. You've probably heard a lot about it. Yes, all my life. Ever since I was six years old, the kids called me Hopsy. Hopsy Pike. Hello, Hopsy. Oh, make it Charlie, will you please? <laughs> All right. But there's something kind of cute about Hopsy. All finished? Yes. You know, uh, maybe you were right about the shoe business. I never realized before how lovely it could be. Oh, thank you. Well, uh... Well? <laughs> well, you'd better get back now. Yes, I guess so. You see where I've been, I mean, up the Amazon, I... I mean, when you haven't seen a girl in a long time, there's something about that perfume. Don't you like my perfume? <laughs> like it? I'm cockeyed on it. Why, Hopsy, you ought to be kept in a cage. Come along, Hopsy. Oh, there you are, my dear. Well, it certainly took you long enough to get back in the same dress. Mr. Pike wanted to hold hands. He's been up a river for a year. Oh, now, look, I am sorry if no, I... No, pay no attention to my daughter's ribaldry. It always comes out in the women of our family. The men are all missionaries, with the exception of myself. And what an exception. Won't you sit down, Mr. Pike? I've just been amusing myself with a little solitaire. Oh, cards. Oh, well, by the way, uh, have you seen this one? Now you see the card, and now you don't. Oh, he does card tricks. Well, bless my soul. Do that again, will you? Certainly. Now you see it. Now you don't. Amazing. Wonderful. You see, you palm it in this hand. Of course, it takes a good deal of practice. Oh, I can well imagine it might. It's a good thing I know who you are, or I wouldn't play cards with you. Huh? Well, you know what they say, my boy. Gamblers on boats. Oh. Oh, oh, you don't really think that... Oh, way. of course not, silly. You look as honest as we do. Oh, thank you. Not <laughs> at all. Just joshing you, my boy. How about a rubber of bridge right now? Oh, I'd like to. Oh, you're probably much too good for us, Mr. Pike. Well, I don't have to play my best. Well, aren't you sweet? Who will we get for a fourth? Isn't there a three-handed game? I seem vaguely to remember having... Of course a... there is. Then it'll be much cozier. Will you shuffle? Well, I'll try. Now, let's see. I am not very good at this. There you are, my boy. At ten cents a point, I owe you $498. Oh, now, wait. I didn't want to win from you. Oh, father's in the oil business, Mr. Pike. It just keeps bubbling up out of the ground. How much do I owe? Now, let me see. Roughly $100. That's rough enough. Oh, but look, I really feel... Oh, don't you worry. We'll get it back. Well, if that's a promise. You can depend on it. Well, if you don't mind, I think I'll toddle off and leave you young people to talk about uh, whatever young people talk about. Good night, sir. I'm really awfully sorry about this. Oh, beeswax, my boy, beeswax. Good night, Jeannie. Good night, darling. Good night. Now, he's a nice fellow, your father. He's a good card player, too. Uh, do you think so? Well, I don't want to be rude, but I thought he seemed a little uneven. He's more uneven sometimes than others. Well, that's what makes him uneven, of course. <laughs> yes. But now you, on the other hand, with a little coaching, you could be terrific. Uh-huh. 
You really think so? Oh, yes. You have a definite nose. Well, I'm glad you like it. Do you like any of the rest of me? Oh, <laughs> well, what I meant was in the card playing sense. I know what you meant. I was just flirting with you. Oh. Oh, I... I see. You're not going to faint, are you? Uh, who, me? Oh, no, it's... It's that perfume. Oh. Did you think they're dancing any place on board? Don't you think we ought to get some rest? You can see me to my cabin if you want. Oh. You, you know, you're certainly a funny girl for anybody to meet who's been up the Amazon for a year. It's a good thing you weren't up there two years. Yeah. Come on. Say, I'm afraid you're on the wrong deck. Well, isn't that a coincidence? Well, for heaven's sake, here's my cabin. Fantastic! <coughs> Would you care to come in and see Emma? That's a new one, isn't it? All right, why not? Shh! I don't want to wake her up. Wake who up? Emma. Emma? Who's Emma? I thought that was just a gag. Well, technically, she's a Columbrina Marditzia, a rare type of Brazilian glass snake. A which... snake? Say, she's she gotten out of a box. She's out! Oh, no, no, oh. Don't worry, she's around here someplace. Oh. Be careful where you step. Oh, let me out of now, here! Now, wait, listen, she's as playful as a kitten. Oh, oh come back! Don't you come in here. Look, I'm terribly sorry. I wouldn't have frightened you for anything Why in the world. Why didn't you tell me you had a slippery But I thought crawling. you understood that Emma was a snake. How could I understand anything of the kind? Why should I suspect an apparently civilized oh, man? Look under the bed. Oh, how could you possibly get oh, to your cabin? Oh, please, please. Oh, all right. What's this? Oh. Oh, it's just a stocking. Oh. Oh, well, if you see any more, just leave them there. Oh, come over here. Hold me tight. Oh. Oh, you don't know what you've done to me. Well, I, I'm terribly sorry. I I wouldn't have frightened you for anything in the world. I, I mean, if there's anyone in the world I wouldn't want to frighten, it's you. Oh, you're very sweet. Don't let me go. I, I won't. Thank you. Uh, how was everything up the Amazon? All right, thank you. What are you thinking about? Nothing. Are you always going to be interested in snakes? Well, snakes are my life, in a way. What a life. I suppose it does sound sort of silly. I, I mean, I suppose I should have married and settled down. Well, why didn't you? Well, it's just that I've never met her. I suppose she's around somewhere in the world. Well, I suppose you know what she looks like and everything. I think so. How are her teeth? Hmm? Well, you should always pick one out with good teeth. It saves expense later. Oh, now you're kidding me. No, not badly. You have a right to have an ideal. I guess we all have one. What does yours look like? He's a little short guy with lots of money. Oh. Why short? What does it matter if he's rich? It's so he'll look up to me, so I'll be his ideal. It's a funny kind of reasoning. Yeah, well, look who's reasoning. And when he takes me out to dinner, he'll never add up the check and he won't smoke greasy cigars or use grease on his hair and... Uh, oh, yes, he won't do card tricks. Oh. Well, I shouldn't think your kind of ideal was so difficult to find. Oh, he isn't. That's why he's my ideal. What's the use of having one if you can't ever find him? Well, when I marry, it's going to be somebody I've never seen before. I won't know what he looks like or where he'll come from or what he'll be. I... I want him to sort of take me by surprise. Like a burglar? Yes, that's right. And the night will be heavy with perfume, and I'll hear a step behind me and somebody breathing heavily. And then I... What's the matter? Hmm? You're looking sick again. Oh, no. I'm not. It's just you being so near you. I, I'd i like to be near you always. Why, how? Are you proposing to me so soon? Oh, no, no, no. Of course not. Well, then you ought to be more careful. People have been sued for much less. Well, not by girls like you. Oh. Don't you know it's dangerous to trust people you don't know very well? But I know you very well. No, no. I, I mean people you haven't known very long. Well, I've known you a long time. In a way. Jean. Jean. Good night. Huh? Oh, you better go. I, I think I can sleep peacefully now. Oh, I wish I could say the same. Why, Hopsy! Ah, uh, thank you, Gerald. High card cops are on the outside, cold hands in the 
cold hands I love. Hello, Harry. Hello, Gerald. Hello, Jean. Greetings, my little minx. I hope I find you well and that your little pal hasn't fallen overboard. He's all right. He's just gone to dress for dinner. Then I think, my dear, you'd better do the same, because we are going to play a little cards tonight, and I don't mean old maid. Harry, I think Charles is in love with me. No. Of course he's in love with you. Who is he not to be in love with you? No, I mean on the level, Harry. Are you suggesting that the others were on the bias? Oh, stop kidding. <laughs> you see... I like him, too. Well, why shouldn't you like him? There's as fine a specimen of the sucker sapiens as I've ever seen. I think he's going to ask me to marry him. No, no. Yes. But that's wonderful, Jean. We shall play high card tonight. He won't know an ace from a deuce. You weren't thinking of taking him, Harry. Well, what were you thinking of? Oh, I don't think you understand. This is on the up and up. I... I'm in love with the poor fish. And I want to be exactly the way he thinks I am, the way he'd like me to be. I'm sure that's very noble, Jean. And I wish you all the happiness in the world. And you'll go straight, too, won't you, Harry? Straight to where? <laughs> you know what I mean. You can come and live with it. Think how peaceful you can be. Playing cribbage with Gerald? I can just see myself. You tend to your knitting. I'll play the cards. Not with him. Do you happen to remember that that sucker has $600 of ours in his pocket? Well, I suppose you could take that back. You bet I could, and a little dividend along with it. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Yes. No. And that settles it. Children don't respect their parents anymore. I think I've had enough, Colonel. I'll make you a check for what I owe you. No, 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 my boy. I, I wish you wouldn't do that. Here, we'll cut the cards once more. Double or nothing? No, thanks. I'd rather pay 32000 than lose a really large amount. Well, now, this is very embarrassing. Make it out to cash. It could even be more embarrassing. $32,000 no sense. Here you are, sir. I feel terrible, my boy. Oh, by the way, I'd prefer if you wouldn't tell Jean anything about this. You may depend upon it. You certainly may. Jean. My sweet. Charles, you promised me you wouldn't play anymore. Well, we didn't play anymore, Jean. We were just wiping out my loss. You need a keeper. And now, Father, that you've taught Charles not to play double or nothing, what are you going to do with that check? Just this, my pretty child. I shall tear it up. You mean it was just a joke? Of course. You don't actually think I'd bleed my own daughter's friend, do you? Perish the thought. Come on, Charles, you can take me for a walk on deck. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It makes you feel all clean inside and nice. Yes. Jean, don't move. What is it? You know, I've just understood something. Yes? It came over me all of a sudden. I, I'm in love with you, Jean. I've never loved anyone but you. I know that sounds as dull as a drugstore novel, but it's what I feel. I wish we were married and on our honeymoon right now. Oh, so do I. But it isn't as simple as all that, Hopsy. I'm terribly in love, and you seem to be too, so one of us has to think and try and keep things clear. Maybe I can do that better than you can. They say a moonlit deck is a woman's business office. I'm going to kiss you, Jean. Of course you are, darling. I said to Myrtle, I said, I don't care for those people. Mrs. Bullock, what are you trying to tell me? What are you talking about? The Harringtons. Myrtle, show Mr. Pike what we got from the purser's office, dear. Yes, Mama. You see, Mr. Pike? It's a photograph, and there's something on the back. Listen. Handsome Harry Harrington and his daughter, Jean, professional card shops. Let me see that. It's the Harringtons, all right. Also bunco, oil wells, and occasional gold mines. Card shops. We're sorry we had to tell you, Mr. Pike, but it's for your own good, of course. And like I said... May I keep like, this picture? Uh, you certainly. And if you would Thanks, like... Thanks, goodbye. Uh, oh, Mr. Pike, will you have dinner with us tonight? No, I will not. <gasps> Why, the ungrateful... Mama, but, but... I thought you said he'd be glad to hear about it. Shut up! Straight scotch, double. Yes, sir. Why, Hopsy... 
What are you doing at the bar at this hour? Good morning. Good morning, darling. You look like the last grave over near the willow. Are you worried about something? Should I be? Of course you should, falling in love with an adventurist on the high seas. Are you an adventurist? Of course I am. All women are. If you waited for a man to propose to you from natural causes, you'd die of old maidenhood. Jean. Yes, darling? You'd better take a look at this photograph. Oh. It's a rotten likeness, isn't it? I never did care for that picture. I can understand that. Oh, please don't look so upset, darling. I was going to tell you when we got to New York. I, I would have told you last night only. Well, you never know how a person will take a thing like that. And, well, maybe I wanted you to love me a little more, too. You believe me, don't you? All right. Anyway, I'm glad you got the picture this morning instead of last night. You thought you were having a lot of fun with me, didn't you? Oh, I was having a lot of fun with you, Hopsy. More fun than I've ever had with anybody. You were certainly very funny showing Harry how to palm a card. You were pretty funny yourself. When? Trying to play me for a sucker when they told me who you were the morning after I met you. Who told you? Never mind who told me. You mean you, you were playing me for a sucker? I don't believe it. But if you were, if you were just trying to make me feel cheap and hurt me, you succeeded handsomely. You ought to be very proud of yourself, Mr. Pike. Very proud of yourself. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Barbara Stanwyck, Ray Milland, and Charles Coburn, will bring us Act Two of The Lady Eve. And now we place our imaginary microphones on a rehearsal stage over at Columbia Studios, where two young extras are just finishing a dance routine. I feel like a wilted lettuce leaf. <laughs> that certainly was a workout. And me with a date tonight. Me too. Say, we better get going. What we need is time for a nice, warm, soothing bath. Mary, isn't that Rita Hayworth over there? Boy, she looks like a million, doesn't she? She sure does. And after the hours she danced in that ballroom scene today. Well, we're not the only ones who know what a nice, relaxing Lux toilet soap bath can do for a gal. Yes, lovely Rita Hayworth and other Hollywood stars use their complexion soap, gentle white Lux toilet soap, for their daily beauty bath, too. Try this Hollywood beauty bath, and you'll see why. You'll find Lux soap's creamy, active lather soothing and gentle and thorough too that rich caressing lather just floats away every trace of dust and dirt leaves you feeling exquisitely fresh from head to foot and most important of all you'll find as screen stars do that this beauty bath makes daintiness sure lovely rita hayworth says a daily lux soap beauty bath protects daintiness it leaves skin really fresh and sweet fragrant too with a delicate clinging perfume why not take Hollywood's tip? Make this fine white soap with its flower-like fragrance your daily bath soap. It's a luxury that any woman can afford. For Lux toilet soap costs but a few cents a cake. Buy it the economical three cakes at a time way. It's thrifty. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Starring Barbara Stanwyck as Jean Harrington, Ray Milland as Charles Pike, and Charles Coburn as Colonel Harrington. G. 
Jean is not the kind of girl to grieve over a blighted romance. But she still thinks occasionally of Charles Pike. It's two months later, and her father at the racetrack, Jean imagines that she sees Charles in the crowd. Here you are, my sweet. We grabbed down and each 700 on the last counter, Jean. Jean, I'm talking to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was that Pike fellow over there. Now, let me see. What do you like in the next one? Pardon me, is this seat taken? Well, for the love of... Well, bless my soul, handsome Harry. William at the moment. William, of course. I'm enchanted to see you again. And you, Jean, as pretty as a bag of aces. Hello, Pearly. Sir Alfred at the moment, my child. Sir Alfred McLennan Keith, at your service. How do you do, Sir Alfred? Well, you're certainly a sight for lame peepers. You know, I haven't seen anybody of our set since the boat stopped running. What's your pitch, Pearly? I have a little nest on the edge of a town called Bridgefield. A town full of millionaires in the heart of the contract bridge mill. Bridgefield, Connecticut? Precisely. Wonderful pickings. Tell me, do you know the Pikes? Do I know them? I positively swill in their ale. Good old Horace. Oh, 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 what a card player. Do you know Charles, the son? Is he the tall backward boy who's always toying with toads? Yes, I think I've seen him sculping about. He isn't backward. He's a scientist. Who is that? What it is? I knew he was peculiar. Pearly, could I visit you sometime as your niece? As my niece? My dear girl, there's only one thing. You have to be English. Well, I've been English before. I shall be as English as necessary. Why don't you stop talking nonsense? Because I want to see that Pike guy. I've got some unfinished business with him. Can I come, Pearly? Of course, my dear, if you think you can get away with it. You can't, Jean. That snake charmer will spot you in a minute. No, he won't. He may suspect, but he'll never know. Get me a name, Pearly, but British. As a matter of fact, I've mentioned a niece. One Lady Eve Sidwich. Lady Eve Sidwich. Oh, I can see her in the Pike's drawing room now. Old Bridgefield at her feet. Lady Eve Sidwich. Boy, will that ring the bell. <laughs> Oh, go on, Lady Eve. Tell us some more. Well, when I arrived in New York, I wanted to find Uncle Alfred, of course, but I didn't know where he was. All I could remember was that he had said Connecticut. Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good evening, Sir Alfred. Oh, Horace, old boy, I want you to meet my niece, Lady Eve Sidwich. How are you, Lady Sidwich? This is Mr. Pike Eve, Mr. Horace Pike, our host. How'd you do? <laughs> My niece was telling rather an amusing incident, Horace. <laughs> well, go on, please. Thank you. Now, where was I? Uh, you didn't know where Connecticut was. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I took the tube. <laughs> <laughs> the tube? The subway, old boy. Yes, and to the official I said, be so good as to let me off at Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, lady, I don't know where Connecticut is, but this train goes to Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how he knew I was a lady. <laughs> oh, uh, here's my son, Charlie. Charlie, come here. Yes, Father. Oh, uh, Charlie, I want you to meet Lady Eve Sidwich. How do you do? How do you do, Lady Eve? Oh. So nice to see you. Oh, but, but, but oh. What's the matter, son? Who, me? Oh, uh, Is he ill? Charles, what's wrong? Uh, no, no, nothing. I, I mean, well, well, I mean to say, haven't we met? But of course we have. Your father just introduced us. Aren't you feeling well, Charles? Oh, sure, but I, I mean... Oh, I... I'm so sorry. You meant, of course, hadn't you met me before someplace? Uh, yes. Oh, very probably. Let me see. Where could it have been? Uh, Deauville? Uh, no. Biarritz? No. Well, then I give up. It couldn't have been on the southern queen between here and South America, could it? I'm afraid not. You see, I've never been in South America. You've never been in South America? As a matter of fact, I've never been in North America until about three days ago. Oh, you haven't? Well, then, you weren't on the southern queen. Say, what's the matter with you? Oh, well, I I'm sorry. Oh, were you in love with her? Yes, he was in love with her. But he doesn't remember what she looked <laughs> like. Don't let them tease you. You can tell me all about her. <laughs> yeah. Dinner is served. Ah, dinner. May I take you in? Oh, ripping. Thank you. This way, then, we... Uh... Uh, be careful. Oh! Oh! Are you hurt? No, I I just tripped over the sofa. Oh, look, you have hors d'oeuvres all over your shirt. Yes, I'll have to go up and change. Oh, yes, you are a little sticky. Uh, now, look, son, you haven't uh, been hitting the bottle lately, have you? Oh, of course he hasn't. Anybody's apt to trip. Not over a sofa. 
That sofa's been there for 15 years. No one ever fell over it before. Oh, well, now the ice is broken. You go upstairs, Charles, take a bath, and I'll like you just as much as ever. Toodaloo. So long. Excuse me. Thank you. Be careful! Oh! She did it again. <laughs> I've never seen such a farce in a respectable house. If I didn't hate him so much, I would have felt sorry for him last night. Do you know why he didn't recognize me? Yeah, I think so. No, you don't. I hardly recognized him myself. He seems shorter and bonier. It's because we don't love each other anymore. On the boat, I saw him as very tall and very handsome. And he probably thought I had big melting eyes and a rosebud mouth and a figure like Miss Longbeach. <laughs> and so you have, for that matter. Well, now that you've got him, what are you going to do with him? Finish what I started. I'm going to dine with him, dance with him, swim with him, laugh at his jokes, uh, canoodle with him. And then one day, about six weeks from now, he'll propose. But you won't accept him. Oh, oh, yes. That's part of the plan. Gee! I know just how it will happen. We'll be out riding and we'll come to a view that will be so gorgeous, we'll have to get off our horses to admire it. I think that's when he'll kiss me. <laughs> Look, Charles, isn't it lovely? Let's get off, shall we? Oh, right ho. Here, let me help you. Thank you. <gasps> Why, Charles, you kissed me. Yes, I did. Eve. Yes, Charles? Eve, I suppose you know what I'm thinking about. Uh -huh. I have an idea. The union of two people for life, that is, marriage, shouldn't be taken lightly. Oh, how wise you are, Charles. I think that if... If there's one time in your life to be careful, to weigh every pro and con, this is the time. Oh, yes, yes. You can't be too careful. That's right. Now, you might think that having known you such a short time... Oh, I, I feel I've known you always. That's the way I feel about you. Charles. Eve, darling. I don't need to tell you of the doubts I've had, but I want you to marry me. Oh, Eve, you're so beautiful. You're so fine. You're so, so... Oh, I don't deserve you. Oh, but you do, Charles. If anybody ever deserves me, you do. Richly. Eve. Charles. Here's a telegram, Gerald. I have caught the sucker sapium. Leaving for Miami on honeymoon tonight. I still despise him. Love, Jean. If she hates him, why did she marry him? To teach him a lesson or something? I don't know. Maybe she's going to shoot the beggar. Comfortably? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, darling. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> oh, it's nothing. It's just that it's so different. It reminds me of that other time. Oh, what time was that? Oh, goodness. I must be a little bit hysterical. You see, we didn't have any money, so we went third class, and there was a farmer on the opposite bench with a cheese in his lap. Oh, it was very unromantic. Oh, where were you going? We eloped. Who eloped? Me. Oh, it was really nothing, darling. I was only 16 at the time. I'm sorry I even mentioned it. Let's pretend I didn't, hmm? Who did you elope with? Oh, now I've planted a seed in your mind. Are you sure you want to know? Who was it? Oh, Angus. Angus? Oh, I assure you, darling, he was no one of the slightest importance. He, he, he was just a groom on Father's estate. A groom? Well, not really the groom, of course. He, he used to put on the groom's uniform on his day off, and then he'd be the groom that day. The rest of the time, he was just the stable boy. A stable boy? Yes. The boy who cleans up the stable. Oh, now you're upset. But it was nothing, darling, nothing at all. We ran away, but they caught us and brought us back, and that's all there was to it, except uh, they discharged him. Good. And when they brought you back, it was before nightfall, I trust? Oh, no. You were out all night? Oh, my dear, it took them weeks to find us. <laughs> you see, we'd made up different names all the time. Oh, you'd die laughing at some of the names we thought of. I'm sure I would. Oh, now you're upset. Well, who wouldn't be? Oh, Charles. Charles, please stop pacing back and forth. You're making me dizzy. Eve, 
Eve, listen to me. Yes, dear. Eve, if there's one thing that distinguishes a man from a beast, it's the ability to understand, and understanding forgive. Surely the qualities of mercy, understanding, and sweet forgiveness... Sweet what? Sweet forgiveness! Oh, yes, yes, go on, darling. I won't conceal from you that I wish this hadn't happened, but it has. And I want to thank you for being so frank. The name of Angus will never cross my lips again, and I hope that you will do likewise. Oh, Charles, I knew you'd be that way. I knew you'd be both husband and father to me. I knew I could confide in you. Thank you. I wonder if now would be the time to tell you about Herman. Herman? Herman? Who's Herman? <laughs> and that's all. I said goodbye to Vernon the next day. Vernon? I thought you said Herman. Vernon was Herman's friend. What a friend. <laughs> Which one are you talking about now, Hubert or Herbert? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. You see, they were John's twin cousins. John, who in the name of... Let me out of here! What's the matter with you, Gene? They want to make a settlement. His father's on the phone right now. Tell him I don't want to talk. Hello? No, no, no. Yes. Hold on, Gerald. Hold on. Now listen, Gene. They'll give you half when you leave for Reno and the balance at the end of six weeks. For once, we have a chance to make some honest money. Oh, tell him to go peel an eel. I don't think you realize the beauty of your situation. You're holding a royal flush. You've got him right by the ears, Jean. You know I had nothing to do with this arrangement, but now that you're in it, you might as well go all the way. All right, I will. Give me the phone. That's the girl. Here you are. Hello. Mr. Pike, this is Eve. I, uh... I'm awfully sorry about the trouble I've made. I thought I had a reason, but now I... Well, I just wanted to tell you this. I don't want any money. Jeannie. I don't want anything. He can have back his jewelry and anything else there is. My own daughter knifing me in the back. There's only one thing I do want, Mr. Pike. I, I want to see him first, and I... I want him to ask me to be free. That's all. No money, no nothing, but... There's something I want to say to him before we part. What? He's already gone? Gone where? Havana. Oh, I see. Thank you, Mr. Pike. Well, you certainly fixed it. Hurry, get your things packed. I refuse to go to Reno with you. Reno? We're going to Havana. I don't see him, my dear. Do you suppose he missed the boat? He didn't miss it. There he is at the bar. Well, oh, yeah. Now he's turning away. He's coming over here. Do you suppose he's seen us? He will in a minute. Stick out your foot, my dear. Oh! Oh, oh why don't you look... Why, Hopsy! Jean, what are you... Oh, Jean. Hello, my boy. What Hello. a surprise, Hopsy! Oh, Jean, if you only knew what it means for me to find you again, can we go to your cabin or someplace, huh? Now, just a minute. Oh, Colonel, I'm delighted to see you again, too. We must play cards this trip. Lots and lots of cards. Come on, Jean, come on. I'm going to kiss you. Hopsy, darling. Oh, why didn't you take me in your arms that day on the boat? Why did you let me go? Don't you know you're the only man I ever loved? Don't you know I waited all my life for you, you big mug? Will you forgive me, Jean? For what? Oh, you mean on the boat. Well, the question is, can you forgive me? What for? Oh, you still don't understand, do you? We'll have to have a long talk. I don't want to understand. I don't want to know. Whatever it is, keep it to yourself. All I know is I adore you. But there's just one thing I feel it's only fair to tell you. It would never have happened except that you look so exactly like you. And I have no right to be in your cabin. Why? Because I'm married. But so am I, darling. So am I. In a moment, our stars will return for their curtain call. And after that, the president will be on the air. But first, 
Here's a young lady who's just had a bright idea. Hands up, Bill. Hey, Ruthie, what's this? <laughs> just a skein of wool for that service sweater I'm making you. And you can help me wind it. Here, let me slip it over your wrist. Now I'll start winding. There, see how fast it goes? Oh, don't hurry. This is a break for me. Why, I can just sit here and look at you. Oh, gosh, honey, but you're pretty. Well, that's how it is with Lux girls. You know, there's something quite irresistible about a fresh, lovely complexion. A lovely Lux toilet soap complexion. And clever girls don't take chances with this charm. They use gentle Lux toilet soap regularly. They know what this fine white soap can do to help keep skin soft and appealing. For Lux toilet soap has rich, active lather that removes stale cosmetics and every trace of dust and dirt from the skin. Here's the active lather facial our pretty Lux girl depends on. Never neglects a single day. I pat the creamy Lux soap lather lightly in, rinse with warm water, then a dash of cool, and pat with a soft towel to dry. My skin feels so beautifully smooth afterwards. Try this Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Facial for 30 days. See what it can do to make your complexion lovelier. Remember, famous screen stars use this simple care. It's right for delicate skin. Get three cakes of smooth white Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. We've said goodbye to the Lady Eve, but here come Barbara Stanwyck, Ray Milland, and Charles Copeland for a curtain call. Thank you, C.B. It's grand being back again. You know, I was rather glad to see Ray getting that rough treatment tonight. There's a pal for you. What did I ever do to you, C.B.? <laughs> well, I just thought that after you had spanked Paulette Goddard, thrown her overboard, and put her through a hurricane and reaped the wild wind, you had a little punishment coming from the fair sex. The heroine really seems to take a beating in all those DeMille pictures, Barbara. I should know, Charles. I went through it once. I never hit a lady in my life until I worked for him, Barbara. Well, don't make it a habit, Ray. It isn't something women are sure to enjoy, like, well, like Lux Soap, for instance. I may have said this before, C.B., but it'll stand repeating. I think Lux Soap is wonderful for the complexion. I've used it for years. Like old friends, Barbara, Lux Soap never fails. What have you got on the schedule for next Monday, C.B.? Just about a thrill a minute, Charles. Because our play is the Warner Brothers hit, Manpower. And starring in it will be Edward G. Robinson, Marlena Dietrich, and George Raft. It's an action-packed drama of the courageous men who work on the power lines of a nation. A story of the manpower behind the electric power and the woman power behind the manpower. The high-tension cast is headed by Marlena Dietrich, George Raft, and Edward G. Robinson. That should mean standing room only, C.B. I certainly won't miss it. And it's just about time for President Roosevelt, Vice President Wallace, and Secretary Wickard to speak now. So you better get a comfortable seat and get ready to hear them. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. A bright red apple for the lady. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Raft, Edward G. Robinson, and Marlena Dietrich in Manpower. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Barbara Stanwyck will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, The Great Man's Lady, and Ray Milland in The Lady Has Planned. The picture, Lady Eve, was written and directed by Preston Sturgis, whose current picture is Sullivan's Travels, starring Joel McRae and Veronica Lake. Heard in tonight's play were Keith Hitchcock as Sir Alfred, Eric Snowden as Gerald, Ferdinand Munier as Pike, and Verna Felton, Thomas Mills, Doris Cederholm, and Warren Ash. Tune in next Monday night to hear Marlena Dietrich, Edward G. Robinson, and George Raft in Manpower. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
if you are ever in the San Francisco Bay Area and still love collecting or renting DVDs or VHS tapes, come check out Captain Video and San Mateo at 2837 South El Camino Real. Captain Video is open six days a week and closed on Wednesday and one of the last traditional video stores still running in the United States. New movies you can rent for $2.99 a day. Old movies you can rent for $2.99 for five days. And if renting isn't your thing, you can also purchase anything you find in the store. Be sure to tell Ira that you heard about Captain Video from the Damn Good Movie Memories podcast. Happy renting and happy collecting at Captain, Captain Video. 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 Come hang out and chill with Brian A. Davis and the Bad Beat. Wednesdays, 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on ThatMetalStation.com.